This tutorial is a project of nonprofitaccountingbasics.org, a free resource developed by the Greater Washington Society of CPAs Educational Foundation. Hello, my name is Sean Miller. I'm a partner with Caliber CPA Group in Washington, D.C. And today we're going to be talking about internal controls to help deter fraud. So let's talk a little bit about background and why this is important. 2012, the ACFE, so the Association for Certified Fraud Examiners, issued their report to the nation, as they do every year, and what they found was these primary internal control weaknesses that were present in over 80% of the fraud cases they studied. A lack of controls, an override of existing controls, a lack of management review, and a poor tone at the top. Now, this report encompassed organizations of all shapes and sizes, nonprofits, for profits, large, small, anything you can imagine. So these cases and these internal control weaknesses were present in nonprofit organizations as well. Now just to take a quick step back, let's define what fraud is so we know what we're talking about. Fraud is an intentional or deliberate act to deprive another a property or money by guile, deception, or unfair means. Now you'll notice that it's intentional or deliberate. There is no such thing as accidental fraud. People make mistakes, yes, fraud is intentional and deliberate. And there are two main types of fraud. Misappropriation of assets, stealing, which is the most common, and then you have fraudulent financial reporting. So that's misrepresentations in financial reports. These are more commonly committed by top management, more common among publicly traded companies, and get much more press. So for example, a situation going back a few years like an Enron or a WorldCom, they committed fraudulent financial reporting in an effort to increase their stock price. Not really relevant to the nonprofit world that we're going to discuss today. However, there are some situations where it is applicable. What we're going to talk about today is misappropriation of assets and some controls we can put into place to stop that. So the fraud triangle, many years ago, um, some academics came up with this fraud triangle. For fraud to occur, you need three things. Pressure, someone has to have a need to commit the fraud. Rationalization, they need to be able to justify what they're doing in their own mind. And opportunity. Opportunity is the one area that we can attempt to control. And we're going to attempt to insert some internal controls that allow us to do so. Now, a lot of people say, well, no one's going to steal from a nonprofit. This is more of a for profit world problem. And that is 100% incorrect. What makes nonprofits unique and possibly more susceptible to fraud? It tends to be a more trusting culture, certainly in your smaller, cause-driven nonprofits, people are supporters of the cause. You want to believe that people who are supporters of a cause that you are also passionate about are more trusting. You could have excessive control by a business manager. And I use the phrase business manager to encompass controller, CFO, accounting manager, whoever happens to control the books in your organization. Um, Failure to include individuals with financial expertise on the board. Again, often the board of directors at a nonprofit is comprised of large donors or people who are, support the cause and are passionate about the cause. Reduced resources result in cuts to administrative staff. We've all seen this. When a nonprofit is having tough times and they need to make cuts, the first place they're always going to cut is to the administrative staff. The program staff is not getting the cuts. So when you cut the administrative staff, people have more responsibilities. You lose some segregation of duties, perhaps some um, review time, and so on. And then you have smaller organizations that simply may not have the resources to have appropriate segregation of duties. You may only have one person handling all the accounting functions and finance functions. So how do you address that and mitigate those risks. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Internal controls. Internal controls are far and away the most effective way to deter fraud. 
and I purposely use the word deter fraud because there's no way to prevent fraud. If somebody wants to steal from you, they will find a way to do so. So the key is to deter it if possible, and if you can't deter it 100%, to detect it as quickly as possible. It's important you follow the controls 100% of the time. There can't be exceptions to the rules for this person or that person. Controls have to be followed 100% of the time. Segregation of duties is the key control related to fraud deterrence and prevention. It's much more difficult for someone to commit fraud if they have to have someone else involved. Um, it takes a lot of nerve to talk to the person sitting next to you and ask them if they want to join you in a plot to steal money from the organization. And there are two types of controls that we'll get into, as was mentioned earlier. Deterrence controls, so hopefully deterring someone from committing the fraud, and detection controls. How quickly can we detect that fraud once we find it? Tone at the top. That was mentioned in the very beginning. I want to bring it up here. Tone at the top is not really an internal control, but it refers to the attitude and mindset of the entity's officers and leaders. It's that attitude that permeates through the organization and is a major deterrence control. So for example, if everybody knows the policy is to get reimbursed for business expenses, you need receipts for all items over $25. It needs to be documented the business purpose, um, where it happened, who was with you, and so on. That control and that procedure needs to apply to everybody all the way from the top down. So you can't have a situation where the executive director of the organization simply turns in their credit card bill and says, reimburse me for this because that then is going to get noticed by the accounting staff and by other people through the organization and they're going to have the mindset that well it doesn't these rules don't apply to the boss why do they apply to me and that creates the wrong tone at the top you want the tone at the top to be one where internal controls are important they're followed and if there's situations where people push back against those controls that the leadership supports the controls and does not allow for exceptions and one-off situations. Some behavioral red flags, again, that were noted in the report to the nation. And again, this gets back to that pressure arm of the triangle. And again, none of these things are proof that fraud's being committed, obviously, but maybe situations that are somewhat indicative of fraud or that that pressure is there. Um, living beyond one's means, financial difficulties, unwillingness to share duties. A lot of times, you know, we'll see people who they never take vacation and they wear that like a badge of honor. But you have to ask yourself, is that really a symptom or a way to cover up the fact that they're stealing? Right? Addiction problems, again, refusal to take vacations we talked about. Unusually close relationships with a vendor or a customer. Again, sometimes we often wear with a badge of honor that, I, well, I know that customer so well. We, you know, we have dinner together, we vacation together, but that could lead to a conflict of interest situation and something that just needs to be monitored. And this wheeler-dealer attitude, again, that gets into the tone at the top. How do the leadership treat the organization? They treat it freewheeling, just spending the money as if, you know, there's no consequences or really being fiscally responsible and transparent with how the money is being spent. Okay, so let's talk about the controls now. We're gonna focus on the cash disbursement side in this webinar. Again, that is far and away the most common area for fraud. Um, it's the easiest place to commit fraud. Um, again, so it's the most common. Some common schemes, billing schemes, fraudulent vendors, um, that situation where someone just possibly creates a vendor in the system uh, with technology the way it is now, it is very, very easy to create an official invoice, send it into the organization, could get paid. Check tampering, that's a situation where after the checks are signed, they're manipulated in some way. And expense reimbursement schemes are probably the most common one that, that we see. And that's a situation where someone incurs personal expenses either on a corporate card 
or they put it on their expense report and get reimbursed for them. So what are some ways that we can deter fraud from occurring in those schemes we just discussed? And what we've tried to lay out here are just some basic things that you could do. Don't need to have a huge accounting staff to do this. Um, these can all be done with a small staff, maybe with some involvement of the board or some other people. The first one is access rights in the system need to be limited to only the activities necessary to perform the job and should be reviewed. Um, too often, we'll go into a situation and when they assign someone rights in the accounting system, they just give everybody full rights just for ease. So the AP person may once a year have to do some work on the payroll side because the payroll person's on vacation, so they give that person full access rights. That is not what you want. You want people to know that they're only given the rights for what they need and they can't go in and do other things. The second item, obviously invoices and checks shouldn't be approved by the individual who prepares the checks. You know, the individual who prepares the check should not be allowed to add vendors into the accounting system. Again, this is one that could be difficult if you have a small accounting department. So if you don't, if you have a small accounting department and the person needs to be able to add vendors on the fly, so to speak, as they're processing checks, there should be reports run that show, all right, here's all the new vendors that were added to the system with this check run. That way, who's ever signing the checks can flip through that and see, all right, why do we add these vendors? If you're a small enough organization that there's only one person processing checks, then the individual who's signing the check should be knowledgeable enough to say, well, yeah, that vendor makes sense. I don't know why that vendor's here, um, and so on. Vendor code should be used for all disbursements. Never use a temp vendor or miscellaneous vendor. All vendors should be added to the system with the appropriate information. Um, from their I-9 form and so on. Checks shouldn't be returned to the individual who requested it. Again, ideally you're large enough that they get signed, they go to someone, they get mailed out. When they get returned, that's when you have a situation where someone could do some check tampering and mess with the information. So those were the deterrence controls. And you'll see the objective with these is to put the fear of getting caught in people and to eliminate the opportunity for them to commit the fraud, right? The, the threat of getting caught is much more valuable than actually catching someone doing something, right? If people think there's a chance they're gonna get caught, it gives them pause before they're going to commit fraud. Some detection controls. The bank statement should be opened by someone who doesn't prepare the checks. So again, if you're accounting, manager or again if you only have one person prepares the checks the bank statement should go to somebody else executive director or maybe a copy to the treasurer and they should open it and review the bank statements just looking at the checks again make sure there's no unusual markings on them nothing changed um, that all the vendors appear correct same thing with the bank reconciliations they need to be reviewed by someone who doesn't prepare the checks you know, make sure that they are mathematically correct. Any unusual reconciling items need to be brought up and investigated. Are there things that have been on there for months and months and months? Are there checks that haven't cleared? Why is that? Um, some other controls related to disbursements. You know, checks should always be mailed, not hand delivered. Um, vendor files should be purged on a regular basis. This is something that a lot of people don't don't think to do, right? You inactivate vendors possibly in your system or you just never use them. The problem is if the vendor's already in the system, I wanna create a fictitious invoice to that vendor but just change the address. It's already in the system, it's easy to do. Um, so you wanna make sure you purge your vendor files on a regular basis, get rid of vendors you're not using. Um, again, change reports we talked about earlier. Um, any type of change reports for vendor records need to be reviewed, um, again, by someone who doesn't prepare the checks. Updating signature cards at the bank. Obviously, if someone leaves, you want to take them off as soon as possible. 
Credit cards. Again, so we mentioned expense reimbursement schemes. Very, very common. Very easy for someone to do. So you have to give special attention to these. Who's reviewing and approving the credit card statements and expense reports? That becomes a situation, for example, with the executive director. Who's reviewing that person's credit card statement? And not simply reviewing it to make sure that there's receipts for everything, but reviewing it to make sure those expenses are necessary and reasonable for the organization. What we typically recommend is that the treasurer or a vice president of finance, whoever you have in your organization, be the one charged with reviewing the executive director's credit card statement or expense reports. Now they can do that quarterly. You have quarterly meetings. You know, it shouldn't be something that's going to hold up payment. Uh, but again, it's something they should do on a regular basis. They should be allowed to ask questions of the executive director. Why did you incur this charge? What was this for? Again, it creates that threat in someone's mind that if they do something they shouldn't be doing, they're going to get caught. Who collects and cancels the credit cards? Again, could be a situation someone leaves, they turn in their credit card, someone else keeps it and uses it. So you need to make sure there's a good process there. And are the cards used for personal charges? Um, you want to limit that as much as possible. Obviously, from time to time, someone may pull out the wrong credit card, charge something on it. If it happens sporadically, that's, that's a normal situation. But if it happens systemically throughout the organization or with just specific individuals, that needs to be addressed. The more you let personal charges on that card, the more you're opening yourself up to a potential problem. You also want to make sure there's no double dipping. So that's a situation where someone puts something on their credit card and also attaches to the receipt to their expense report for cash reimbursement. This can be very easy for someone to do if they get charged on the credit card and then a few months later they turn in the receipt for cash reimbursement. So you need to have a procedure in place to ensure that this isn't happening, um, whether it be reviewing the receipts that get submitted on the cash expense report, making sure they don't have the same credit card number, um, or having procedures in place that certain charges must always be on the credit card um, for certain charges that can only be in cash. There just needs to be something in place, especially if you have an organization where people travel frequently and have large expense reports and credit card statements. So the last area to discuss is payroll. Payroll is obviously, not obviously, it's typically the largest expense area for many nonprofit organizations. And as such, it's subject to fraud just as any other system would be. The key thing related to payroll and deterring fraud and detecting fraud is monitoring the changes made to the payroll system. For example, if someone gets an increase in their compensation, how is that supported and how is that documented? New employees get added, same thing, how is that documented? The easiest way to do this is for the payroll reports from your payroll provider, again, which most organizations use now, to be reviewed by someone who doesn't process the payroll. Again, so it can either go to someone else in the accounting department or someone in the HR department or if you're a smaller organization, you can go right to the executive director. Again, if you're a small enough organization, the executive director is in all likelihood going to have a good handle on how many people there are, what the salary budgets are, and there's unlikely to be changes frequently to the payroll system. Having that review done by someone who doesn't process the payroll but is knowledgeable enough about the organization, again, provides that fear to someone that if they're going to commit fraud, they're going to get caught. Right. Payroll can be such a large number that it's easy to hide a small new hire or a small increase in someone's compensation. That's why these change reports are so vital because they clearly enumerate any changes that were made and eliminate the need to go through each individual transaction. All you have to do is look at the changes. The last thing I always point out, whether you're an auditor or an internal financial person or a board member, what else can you do to help prevent fraud? And just be observant. Look for unusual items in your financial reports. Um, raise questions about the financial reports. Look for unusual behavior among your staff. 
you know, and again, be alert for individuals who are reluctant to train people, accept promotions, or take vacations. Um, oftentimes, that is an indication that they're trying to hide something. So that is all we have today for internal controls to help prevent, deter, and detect fraud. Thank you.